Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Legacies. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I'll be showing the first third of a three-player game today. Now, before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of videos like this in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and many of them come with perks like watching some exclusive content that I make for the supporters of the channel, like impressions vlogs and that kind of thing, as well as being able to vote on some of the videos that are made each month, and you can see those videos early and advertisement free. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask before we get into the game is that if while you're watching this, any part of the game really calls to you, or if there's a turn where you feel like we should have done something differently, then please comment down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before we start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Before we start, I do want to point out that today I'm filming with the deluxe version of the game. There is also a standard version, and while there are several component differences between them, the gameplay is the same. I won't cover all of the differences, but I do want to point out that in the standard game, the player boards and the main board are not dual and triple layered like they are in this deluxe version of the game. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, it starts in the early 19th century, and each player is a rich and famous person, but the idea of this game is to get as much fame as possible over the course of numerous generations. Specifically, this game is going to take place over three centuries and six generations, and over the course of the game, you want to increase the fame of your overall name with your successors so that you have the most at the end of the 21st century. As I just mentioned, during each of the generations, we are going to name a successor for the subsequent generation, and those successors will give various benefits that you will have until you put yet another successor out for the following generation after that. Now, the way we are going to get fame is through a variety of different actions. One of those involves actually investing in different industries, and at the right moment, you can also remove your investment to sell in order to get the money that you need to do other things, like adding to your overall foundation, which is tracked on the outside of this board. The inner track around the board is fame, and having the most of that at the end of the game is how you overall win. Now, in addition to investing, you can also establish various relationships with the different characters in the game. There are 10 different characters that you can play as, and in this game, we have three of them out here, but you can also develop relationships with characters that are not currently being played in the game, and you show that by putting various relationship tokens out on these spots. These will get you various resources and benefits that you can use as you're playing. And in addition to doing that, players can also invest in their own heirlooms. You can also take heirlooms from your opponents, which is a way to actually get more fame for having their stuff. But if you invest in your own stuff, you'll get money, and money is a very important resource in this game. Now, on top of that, there is a bunch of other things that we're going to be doing, and don't worry, I'll cover all of that stuff while we're actually playing. But I do want to briefly mention that on a player's turn, they are going to be either playing a card from their hand, or they could play a card directly from this market by swapping for one of those. So that means this is effectively a shared pseudo hand for all of the players, and each one of these cards can be used in one of five different ways. Instead of playing one of these multi-use cards, you could do a global action, which means you will perform the action down here, and you will get an extra benefit, and then everyone will also get something, so everyone is affected when global actions happen. There are regular global actions and mandatory ones, and once both of the mandatory actions are done, and a certain number of the regulars, that will cause the end of the generation, and that will be the time we move on to the following generation of the game. Once we play through three centuries of generations, the game will come to an end, and whoever has the most fame will be the winner. Now again, I will describe in detail how each one of these things work as we are actually playing, and on that note, I think let's start the game. Today, we are going to play as the purple player right down over here. Now, before we actually take turns in the game, I'd like to focus your attention over here on these player boards. You may have already noticed that two of these are in this orientation, where the long part is on the bottom, and then one of them has the long part on top. Now, this is the above board orientation, and this is the underhanded, and during setup, each player can decide which of these two orientations they want, and that's important because this will affect your special ability that you can perform throughout the game. I'll talk about how we actually activate those later, but in general, the above board special abilities are peaceful in nature, whereas the underhanded abilities can negatively affect your opponents. The rulebook does suggest that for your first game, everyone play above board, but for this tutorial, I have the underworld boss over here being underhanded so that we can see one example of these negative interactive abilities. 
The only difference between above board and underhanded is that special ability. The rest of the icons on these boards are the same. Now, I'll talk about these special abilities more later on, and I think at this point, let's now focus over here and to discuss the turn order track. As you can see, that's right up here, and at the start of the game, we are going to be the first player, white will be second, and yellow will be third. Now, the reason for this is because of our starting foundation. Each one of the characters starts with a certain amount of money, a certain resource, as well as fame and foundation, and on the board, we can see the foundation is tracked on the outside, and fame is tracked on the inside. Now, at the start of each one of the game's six generations, the player with the most foundation will go first, second most foundation will go second, and third most foundation will go third, and so on. As you can see, See, this does play up to six players. So our character started with five foundation, which was the most, which is why we're first. White starts with four, which means they're second, and yellow started only with two, so they are the third player for this first generation of the game. I did mention before that the game takes place over six generations, and at the start of each generation, we once again check these foundation amounts. So if we want to go first or stay in first as the game goes on, we better make sure we have more foundation than the rest of our opponents. Now, I did mention that over the course of these six generations, we'll go through three centuries. Those are tracked right over here, with the first being the 19th century, then the 20th century, and then finally the game will be over at the end of the 21st century. So let's start things off in the first generation, and we can now take the first turn of the game. As I said before, we are the purple player, and today we are playing as the transportation baron with the above board side. Our icon across the whole game is going to be this captain wheel image here. Now on our turn, we can either play a card or we can perform a global action. However, you are not allowed to perform any of these global actions until you've played at least two of these cards within the specific generation that we are in. Obviously, we haven't taken any turns yet, so that means we must play a card, and we have to play another card after that before we can start activating these over here. At the start of each generation, every player is going to get three cards from the current century, and these are the cards that we drew. Now, when we play a card, we can either choose one from our hand, or we could choose one from this face up market. We could take this one, for example, but then we'd have to take a card from our hand and replace that market right over there, and then play this card that we just took. So that means we effectively have a six card hand at this point in the game. For this first action, I think we do actually want to play this card right here. So we have to take one card from our hand and replace it. And I think we'll put this one out there. We could potentially play this one later on, but another one of our opponents could play this before we have another turn. And that's just something we have to keep in mind. This is the card that we took, and we now have to perform one of the five different action options that are listed on it. Now, on every single card in the game, in the lower right, this is a buy an heirloom action, and in the lower left, this lets you do an explore action, and then in the middle, this lets you simply take one of that indicated resource. If we look at the other cards in our hand, we can see that resource can vary, but the effects in the left and right are always going to be the same. Now, I'll talk about these later on, because I think for this turn, we are going to do the top action, which is called making a relationship. So let's look at the top of this card in a little more detail. As you can see, there's actually a left and a right side, which means within this action, we still have a choice to make. We can either form a relationship with this specific character, in this case, that's the inventor, or we could form a relationship with a legendary character. For this turn, I think we are going to start a relationship with the inventor. And when we look out at the board, you can see the inventor's area is right over here. And in fact, there is a spot along the outside for all 10 of the possible player characters. And then down in the bottom left, we have the legendary characters. And I imagine I'll talk more about these soon. So we're going to start a relationship with the inventor. And the way we do that is we take any one of these relationship tokens from our board and we place it down onto the relationship track for the inventor. Now, as you can see, this has a cost of four gold, and that is kind of a problem considering we only start the game with six. Now, that would be a problem if we were not already amicable with the inventor. We can tell this because on our player board in this green area, it tells us which of the 10 characters we are amicable with. For the Transportation Baron, we are amicable with four of them, whereas our opponents are only amicable with three. Now, this is important because as you can see, if you start a relationship with one of these, you do not pay the monetary cost. So that means we don't have to pay anything to start this relationship with the inventor. Now, that being said, every character is hostile with some of the other characters. For us, that is going to be the Underworld boss, which is one of the player characters, as well as the general and the politician. When you start a relationship with someone you are hostile with, you actually have to lose two of your fame. Remember, having the most fame at the end of the game is how you win, so spending fame is definitely not something you want to do often. 
Now there is a third state we can be with various characters, and that is neutral. If a character icon does not show up on any of these spots, then we are neutral with them, and there is no benefit or penalty for starting a relationship with them. Once again, we are going to start a relationship with the inventor though, so we are not going to pay anything, and we can now place this on the inventor's relationship track. That is right over here, and whenever we start a relationship, we go into the leftmost spot. If there were any other relationship tokens in here already, we would push the rest of them down. If this causes a token to be pushed off the end, then that player takes that relationship token and puts it back into their area. Now, it's worth noting that players are never allowed to have multiple of their relationship tokens on one of these tracks, so this is going to be the only one we place down here for the inventor. After placing a new relationship token down, the active player gets the benefit that's listed directly underneath it. In this case, that means we'll get two resources of our choice, and if we're starting a relationship with a player character, then there will be one of these bonus tokens, and we get whatever that token says, and this stays here for the rest of the game. That means we will get two fame for doing this, which will bring us up to eight, and if we glance out, you can see some of these characters that are not being controlled by players don't have these bonus tokens associated with them. Well, let's take our two resources, and they can be of any type. And these are the four options. We have gems, iron, gears, and die. And I think we'll take one gear and one die. We can place these down here along with this iron that we started the game with. We know that because this right here shows a one iron icon. Well, at this point, we've finished this action, so now we can place this card over in our area in such a way to know that we played this, but we can't use it anymore. Remember, this is important because we have to have played two of these cards before we have the opportunity of performing any of the global actions. So, our turn is done, which means it's now time for the white player to go. After considering their options, White is going to play this card from their hand, and it says New Weapon Technology. They've decided, much like us, they would like to start a relationship, but instead of starting one with a possible player character like this general, they are going to start a relationship with a legendary figure. As you can see, there are up to five legendary figures in the game. During setup, we randomly put all of these out, and then those in the first century spot are flipped face up. When we start the second century, this one will flip, and when we start the third century, that one will flip. That means at this point in the game, the white player has these three legendary figures they can start a relationship with, and they are going to have to pay one fame to do this. The cost for this can vary. For example, we have a card in our hand that lets us do this, but we have to pay five money instead. So the white player is going to pay one fame, which brings them down to three, and now they can take a relationship token and put it down onto any of these face-up legendary figures. After considering the options, they are going to go here onto the oracle, and it's worth noting that if someone else had one of their relationship markers there first, then that marker would be bumped by this new one coming in, and then the player who just got bumped will get a benefit of either drawing a random successor tile from this deck or a random card from the current century's deck. Obviously, we weren't there, so nobody got bumped, but I thought it was important that you knew how that worked. After placing this relationship token down, the white player now gains all of the effects that are printed on this legendary figure. For the oracle, this says that they can perform their special effect for their character, but I do want to mention these other two options. As you can see, these, as well as many things in the game, have this red, blue, green iconography on them, and this tells you the effect based off of the century. Red is the first century, blue is the second, and green is the third as you can see right here. So that means if you started a relationship with this rich recluse during the second century, then this would get you 100 money, whereas it would only get you 40 money if you did it during the first. Likewise, down here, this veteran lets you do one, two, or two explore actions, depending on the century when you start that relationship. And I'll talk about how the explore action works later on. So as I said, the white player now gets to perform their character's special action. That special action is right over here, and before we actually activate this, I'd like to talk about a couple other ways that we can activate these on our boards. Now, one way, obviously, is that legendary figure that White just started a relationship with, but another involves just playing cards that say you can do this. For example, this card right here says in the middle, you can play it and spend one fame to perform your character's special action. Now, there is yet another way that you can perform these, and that also involves starting a relationship. If when you do this action, you play a card that matches your specific icon, then you don't start a relationship with yourself. Instead, you get one of two different benefits. The first of these is you can pay the associated cost and then perform your special action, or you can pay the associated cost and then this turns into a wild icon that you can use to start a relationship with any of the characters that is not yourself. So once again, if the inventor had played this, they could pay the four gold and start a relationship with anybody, or they could pay the four gold and then activate their special action. 
Now that we know how to activate these, let's focus in and actually perform it. In this case, it says the inventor can discard one resource from their supply in order to take three, four, or five resources from the supply. Now these slashes indicate the century, so that means they will take three since it's the first century. If it was the second century, they would take four, and if it was the third century, they would take five. So they will get rid of this and then take three resources of their choice. And in this case, they've decided to take two of these gears as well as one iron. After that, their special action says they may acquire an heirloom. Now, this is interesting because that is exactly what this action does on our player cards. Remember, when you play one of these cards, you choose one of the things on it, and one of those simply lets you acquire an heirloom. So that means as part of the inventor's special action, they also are able to do this. So this is another example of how there are many ways to do many of the different actions that are in the game. So let's focus out, and the way acquiring heirlooms works is you can take one heirloom either from your supply or from your opponents, as long as you don't already have an heirloom of that specific level. There are seven levels going from zero all the way up to six, so that means if they were to buy a level two heirloom, then for the rest of the game they can purchase no more level two heirlooms. At the start of the game, every player has a level zero heirloom over here in their personal heirloom collection. In order to acquire the heirloom, players need to spend the resources that are listed on the top, and if you acquire an heirloom that's in front of one of your opponents, then you also have to pay a fame penalty. For example, if the inventor wanted to acquire this cigar box from the underworld boss, they would have to spend two die as well as a cog, and they would also have to give the underworld boss two of their fame. So they would lose two fame, and the underworld boss would gain two fame. At least, that's how it works if you're buying an heirloom from somebody you are amicable with or neutral. If you happen to be hostile, then you actually don't pay that fame penalty. As we can see, the inventor is hostile with the philosopher and the socialite, but unfortunately for them, neither of those are currently in play, so they can't make use of that benefit. Down here, though, we can see the underworld boss is hostile with the general as well as the transportation baron, and we are the transportation baron. That means if the underworld boss wants to acquire any of our heirlooms, they don't pay us that fame penalty, so they are much more likely to do just that. Once an opponent takes one of your heirlooms, there is no way to get it back, but it is worth noting that in an up to three player game, you can only have up to two heirlooms from each of your opponents, and in a four or more player game, you can only have up to one, unless that opponent is amicable with you. If we look over here, it shows a plus one, so that means you can actually take one more than that normal limit. This is a three player game, so the limit is normally two, but if we look over here, this inventor is amicable with us, and that means they could potentially take up to three of our heirlooms, but of course each time they did that, they would have to pay us that fame penalty. There's one more thing to mention about spending resources for these heirlooms, and that is the fact that if you have a relationship with the character that you are purchasing an heirloom from, then you will do it at a minus one resource discount. But again, if you are not hostile with them, you will have to pay them the indicated amount of fame. Currently, the inventor does not have a relationship with any of the characters to make use of that discount. Now, with all of that in mind, they've decided to acquire one of their own heirlooms, and they figure they may as well go cheap, so they are going to take their level one heirloom. As you can see, that is just going to cost them two of these gears, but of course, if one of their opponents had acquired this away from them, then that opponent would have had to pay them one fame. So the inventor can pay the two gears. They can then flip this over because the yellow side is the side that you want when you have bought your own heirloom. This can then be placed over here on the left side of your board. As you can see, it shows that gold bar, and that means at certain times during each generation, these are going to generate money based off of the various industries in the game. Now, if the inventor had instead purchased this away from the underworld boss, it would stay on this orange side, and it would go over here into the other heirloom spot. As you can see, that shows a fame icon, and that means that up to once per generation, this might create fame based on various industries instead of making money. So this is another big thing to consider when deciding if you want to buy your own heirlooms or somebody else. You need to figure, do you want to make more money, or do you want to just make more straight-up fame? Having the most fame is how you win the game, but having money does leave you flexible to do most of the different things that actually happen during the game. Obviously, the inventor did not take this, so that will go over there. They now have a level 0 and a level 1 heirloom, so that means for the rest of the game, they cannot acquire any more level 1 heirlooms from any of their opponents. Now, I do want to mention that once the game is over, each heirloom will be worth 1 fame per level. Since this is a level 1, that's worth 1 fame, and this right over here is a level 6, and that is worth 6 fame. Now, while we're looking at this, these level 6 heirlooms are actually a little different. 
As you can see, they're orange on each side, and that means even if you buy your own orange heirloom, it's going to go over here into this area. Now, the level sixes are thematically pretty interesting because they are the deep, dark secrets of that character. For the inventor, it looks like their deep, dark secret is they actually know about an alien spacecraft. Now, when you take your own level six heirloom, that effectively means you are keeping your secret safe. But if you instead find a way to acquire one of the level sixes from your opponents, it, of course, does go over here into the other spot. And that means that character has effectively learned about the deep, dark secrets of that opponent. For example, this is our level six, and if we look at the uh, text on it, it says railroad stock scam. So that means we are hiding this stock scam, and when one of your opponents learns about this secret, that means they also get to gain the special ability of the player from whom they took this heirloom. Thematically, that is essentially us giving them access to that action so that they stay quiet about this secret that we have. Now, you may have noticed that on neither side of these level sixes is there a fame penalty, so you don't have to pay an opponent some of that fame in order to take these level six heirlooms. But of course, they also take a bunch of different resources, so you need to work for quite some time to gain these. One last thing to emphasize is, of course, if you take somebody else's level six heirloom, you cannot take your own, so that means somebody else could take this and then gain access to your special ability. Well, the inventor is now done acquiring an heirloom because they did spend these resources, and obviously there's quite a bit going on with these heirlooms, but that makes sense considering these are a big way that you can generate money as well as fame as the game goes on. So, the white player is now done with their turn. But before we move on, I'd like to take a quick moment to look at the special actions for the rest of us. We are the Transportation Baron, and our above-board action says Trafficking. When we perform this, we can acquire an heirloom at a two-resource discount or without paying the acquisition fee. And remember, the acquisition fee is the amount of fame that's listed at the top of an opponent's heirloom. So that is interesting that our special action also gets us access to heirlooms. And then finally, we can look over here to the Underworld boss. That sword means this is an underhanded ability, and it's called Extortion. It says you collect half of the gold from up to three opponents, with a maximum of 15, 50, or 150, depending on the century, and then you gain one, two, or three fame. That means in the first century, the Underworld boss could gain up to 15 gold from each of us and gain one fame when they do this, and that only gets better for them and worse for us as the game goes on. Once again, these underhanded abilities generally have negative interactive effects with their opponents, whereas the Dove Icon Above Board abilities are peaceful. Now, I suppose one of us could take the level 6 heirloom from the Underworld boss. In this case, that is some counterfeiting molds, and that would give us access to their underhanded ability, even though we would have an above board ability of our own. So, it's now time for the yellow player to go. After considering their options, they are going to play this card, but they are not going to start a relationship. Instead, they're going to make an investment. Down below, this tells them what kind of investment they can make. There are three general types with the government, progress, and entertainment which you can see up here at the top of the stock market. And then within each of these, there are 10 different industries. There's three for the government, four for the progress, and three for entertainment. When you perform an investment and it shows one of these icons, you can invest in any of the type in that column. But later on in the game, these sometimes show specific industries. And in that case, you might have to build specific industries. In this case, the Underworld boss is going to be investing in government, and they've decided to invest specifically in the military. Now, when you make an investment, you either make a minor one or a major one. When we focus back over here, you'll notice on our player boards, we all have these bags with a five and bags with a two, and the five are major and the twos are minor. Whenever you make an investment, you take one of these and then you place it in the associated industry that you are investing in. And then you have to pay the money value of that specific industry times the number that shows up on that investment. Now, the yellow player currently has eight money and all of the different industries are at the three cost spot. So that means they cannot afford to do a major investment because that would cost five times three or 15 money. And yellow currently only has eight. Fortunately, with eight, they can afford a minor investment, so they will do that minor investment in military. That is going to be two times three or six money that they have to spend in order to do this. And then that investment token can go into the associated industry spot on the board. Now, after that, if this was a minor investment, that specific industry will go up once on this track. If it was a major, which again had a five instead of a two, then this would have gone up twice. 
As you can see, military is now at the four cost spot, so future investments in that are going to be more expensive. But that being said, when you perform this investment action, instead of buying, you can sell. Now that means the sell price has gone up because when you sell, you take up to one of your investments from any industry, and then you get paid out the number on that investment times the current cost of that one. And then if you are selling a small investment, the industry will go down once. And if you're selling a large one, the industry will go back down twice. So if yellow is able to sell this while the token is above the three, they will get back more money than they put into that overall investment. Now, before we move on, I'd like to talk about a couple more things regarding investments. And the first of those is the restriction where you can never have more than one major and one minor investment in any industry at a time. The next restriction involves actually having the investment tokens. As you can see, at the start of the game, we all have three of the majors and three of the minors, but then there are plus symbols right over here, and you can gain access to these extra investment tokens through smartly choosing a successor, and I'll explain how that works later on. In addition to that, I do want to mention that you can also unlock another relationship token, which can be placed over there in that plus spot, and again, it's possible you can do this unlock when you establish your next successor. The next thing I'd like to highlight is the fact that every character has two influenced industries. When we focus on the Underworld Bosses board, you can see that they are influencing military and law. And we can also tell that by looking out at the main board, because we can see the military and law are right next to their character spot around the outside. So at a quick glance, you can see which of the different industries each of the players is influencing. And that's important because the various heirlooms that we all have pay out according to those influenced industries. As you can see, this does show the law and the military on it. And I'll talk about paying out for these heirlooms later on, but that's definitely something we need to keep in mind. The other thing I'd like to mention about these influenced industries is if you play a card that specifically shows one of your two influenced industries, then instead of needing to buy or sell in that industry, you can treat it as a wild and then buy or invest in any industry instead. Well, at this point, yellow is done with their action, and that means we can now take our second turn of the game. Much like the first turn of the game, we must play a card because our other option of activating the global actions can only happen once we have at least two cards played in front of us. So we can play either of these or we can play any of the three that are face up on the table. So these are going to be our five options. Now, I mentioned before that one thing you can do on your turn is play a card for the resource that shows down in the bottom. So both of these could get us one gear. This would get us a gear and these would get us iron. But I think we don't desperately need those resources right now. Another thing we could do is play any of these cards to purchase an heirloom in the way that we have already described. And another option that's available to us is playing any card for the explore action, as you can see down here in the bottom left. Now, I think let's talk about how exploring works before we make our decision. And with that in mind, we can look out here on the board, because as you can see, that icon is for exploration. When you perform this, you will gain all of the benefits that show up in the exploration area. And during the first century, that says we will get two gold for every card that we have already played, and we can take two random successors from the top of the successor deck. Now, if we played a card to explore, we would have played two cards. So by playing one of these cards to explore, we would effectively get two successors as well as for money. Now, this is going to change as the game goes on. Once we go to the second century, we're going to place this right over here. And then when we do the explore action, you only get one successor, but you get 10 money for every card you've played. And then in the third century of the game, this will get you gold as well as fame based off of the cards that you've already played in that generation. Obviously, right now we are in the first century, though and I don't think we want to explore at this moment. Instead, I think we want to play Repossession, which is actually a card that we put out here in our first turn of the game. We have to play one of our cards over here to the market in order to take this, and I think we will put this one right over here, and then we can play this card for one of the many options that are on it. We know about all of the bottom, and we've already talked about the relationship. This says we can spend one fame to start a relationship with the thief, or we could discard one card in order to start a relationship with a legendary figure. The other option right here in the middle is an opportunity, and it says we could spend one fame in order to perform our character's special action. If you remember, our character's special action lets us acquire an heirloom at a discount, and that is quite tempting. However, I think this is even more tempting. Let's go ahead and start a relationship with a legendary figure. Of course, the cost to do that is discarding a card that we already have in our hand, so we can get rid of this, which means we now don't have any cards in our hand. And then we can start a relationship with any of these figures. This one would obviously let us actually perform our special action, and if we bumped this out, then the white player would get a card from this century, or they could get a successor. But I think instead of that, we are going to go up here to the rich recluse. 
This one down here would let us explore once in the first century and twice in the second or third, and it's certainly better in the second or third centuries. But up here, we can see the rich recluse is going to get us 40 money right now because we're in the first century. If it was the second century, we get 100, and if it was the third century, we would get 200 money. Now, 40 money at this point is pretty great considering currently we only have six. So we can take 40 money and we can look up here and see that there's a bunch of denominations in the game. We've got ones, fives, and tens in here, but then we also have 25s, hundreds, and 500s in here. So let's take a 25, that gets us to 30, and then a 10 to get us up to 40 money. These will go down in front of us and we are rich, but we also don't have any more cards that we can play. Having all this money would be great to do a major investment, but again, we need cards to actually do that. So perhaps this was a little bit too late for us to actually make use of the money, but I still think having this around is going to be beneficial for us. All right, that's finished our turn performing this opportunity. So the white player can take their turn. And they've decided they'd like to play this venture capital card from the board. And they will replace it with this spreading your message card. Now with this, they're going to start a relationship, and specifically, they're going to spend one fame to form a relationship with the corporate mogul. Now, actually, they don't have to pay the fame because they are amicable with the corporate mogul, so they can start this relationship without paying anything. And when they place this right over here, you'll notice the benefit they get right now is 20 money. Now, of course, there is not a bonus token next to this because no player is currently playing as the corporate mogul. That means there is a bit of an incentive for forming relationships with your actual opponents around the table, but it looks like the white player wanted an opportunity to get a bunch of money, and having a relationship with the corporate mogul is definitely a way to do that. So they will take their 20 money, and that has finished their turn. White is done, so now the yellow player can take their turn. And they've decided to play an opportunity from this card. That says they can spend two of their money, which they happen to exactly have, and then they can increase one industry value of their choice by one level. Considering yellow has invested in the military, we're not too surprised to see them increase that up one level. So now the buying and selling price for that is up to five. With yellow done, we can take our turn, and we don't have any cards in hand, but we have played two cards. That means we have the ability to perform a global action, and that's certainly what we should do. As you can see, there are eight different global actions, and they are split into two colors. The red global actions are mandatory, so every single generation of the game, both of these have to happen, and when each of these are performed, you flip them over, whereas with the blue ones, not every one of these will happen each generation. In fact, the generation will come to an end once both of the mandatory reds are flipped, and then a certain number of the blues are flipped, depending on the player count. At three and four players, once three out of these six blues are flipped, that will be the moment the generation comes to an end. Now there's only one of these that we cannot choose right now, and that is this one. As you can see, it shows a first with a slash through it, and that means that this one cannot be the first out of the eight global actions to be activated within the generation. That does mean that we still have seven of these options available, and I will be talking about all of them in the video. And I think for now, let's just talk about this one, because that is what we're going to do. This is called Influence Industries. And when we focus in on the action, you can see the top part has a globe on it, and the bottom part has this icon. That means we are going to gain the benefits of the bottom, and everyone will gain the benefits of the top. Now this right here says Influence Industries, and everyone is going to be able to move one industry token up or down once. But then for us, since we are the ones who chose this, we will move both of our Influence Industries up once or down once. When we glance at the board, we can see our influenced industries are manufacturing and tourism, so that means both of those are going to go up once. After that, in turn order, the rest of the players can move one industry up or down once. After us is the white player, and as the inventor, they are influencing science and education, and they've decided to move science up once. After that, the yellow player can go, and they are influencing military and law. I don't think it's too surprising to see them push military up once again, considering they already have a minor investment in that industry. All right, we've now all performed the effect of this global action, but the last thing that happens after we perform the first global action of each generation is we then perform the effects of the icons on the bottom of that tile. Let's put this back over here, and at the bottom of each of these blue global actions, it says we can first draw one successor card from the top of the successor deck, and then we are going to play one of the successors that we have as our successor for the next generation. Now again, this is what it looks like for all of the blue actions, but then for the red actions, it's slightly different. You first take a face-up successor from the board, and then you have to play one of the successors that you have as your next successor. 
when we focus up here, you can see there are two successors out here, and there are two mandatory actions that will always happen. So that means that both of these could be taken within the round. Now it's worth noting, players only take a successor and play one the first time they perform a global action within a given generation. That means if on our next turn we do another global action, whether it is blue or red, we will ignore the bottom entirely because we have already performed that. We do only get one successor for the next generation. Now we didn't choose red, so that means we can't take either of these. We went with one of the standard global actions, so we will take the random one from the top of the deck, and that is Stuart. And we can add them to our area, where we also have Bell. Now we drew Bell randomly at the start of this generation, and as you can see, Bell is a celebrity, and Stuart is a penny pincher. Now we have to choose one of these to be our successor for the second generation of the game. Now there are a few factors that go into choosing a successor, and the first of these is how much foundation do they give us. As you can see, Bell shows a 10, a 25, and a 50 next to that piggy bank, which means foundation, whereas Stuart gives us nothing. Now foundation is important because at the start of each of the game's generations, the player with the most foundation will go first, and second most will go second, and on. So that means by having Bell be our successor, we get 10 added to our foundation, which will potentially increase the chances that we will get to go earlier in the player round for for that next generation. Moving on from the potential addition to the foundation, we can also see that each of the successors has an effect. Some of these effects say now, which means they happen once and then they can be ignored for the rest of the game, and others don't, which means they have an ongoing effect. Now, in general, if a successor is going to give you foundation, that probably means their effect is less powerful. We can see up here for Bell, who is a celebrity, it says that while they are our successor, when we form a relationship, we gain one fame or we steal one fame if the relationship is with an opponent. If we choose Bell, then this will go into effect immediately because right now they are going to become our successor and take over the family business. That will stay in effect until the next successor is chosen, which again will happen the first time we do a global action in the next generation of the game. It's worth noting if you never perform a global action within a generation, you will gain a successor at the end of that generation, and I'll explain how that works later on. Now if we look down here for Stuart, who is a penny pincher, it says if we have them be our successor, we can immediately buy a minor investment in any industry at no cost. When we glance back at the cards, you may have noticed these icons up here, and that just tells you what part of the game these effects interact with. Obviously, Stuart is interacting with investing, and Bell is interacting with relationship forming. Now there's one last thing to pay attention to on these cards, and that is their impact icon. There are six of these icons in the game, and every player character has one associated with them. So us as the Transportation Baron have this Commerce Impact icon, and we can see that Stuart also has that icon, whereas Bell has the Power Impact icon. Now, if we choose a successor whose Impact icon matches our own, then that will be the moment that we can unlock a new token. As I mentioned before, at the start of the game, we all don't have access to one of our major investments, one of our minor investments, and one of our relationship tokens. And the first time we do this match as we gain a successor, we can take one of these and place it onto the associated part of our board. What that means is the first three times you play a successor whose impact icon matches your own, you will unlock one of these tokens. And then if you match a fourth time in the game, you can perform your special action instead. That's pretty great, and if you match a fifth time, you once again can perform your special action. So that means if we pick Stuart right now, that will be our first match, and we can unlock one of these tokens and then use it for the rest of the game. While I do like the idea of gaining 10 foundation, I think Stuart is going to be our successor because of that match, and because I think getting a free minor investment right now is pretty great. Now with that in mind, when we gain this benefit, I think let's just take this minor investment token, and we can place this right over here to show that we have four of them available to us for the rest of the game. And then since we chose Stuart, we would gain any foundation indicated here, but there is none. So Bell is going to be discarded. We did not choose them for our successor. And then since this says now, we can perform the effect. So let's buy a minor investment in any industry without paying any money. Now we would not be able to place this down anywhere where we already had a minor investment, but we don't have any of those yet, so that means we can choose any of these 10. Now there are reasons to invest in your influenced industries, specifically with relation to our heirlooms, which I haven't discussed just yet, but I think instead of doing that, let's invest in the military. The big reason for that is because so far the military has gone up the most on this track, and I think I'd like to capitalize on that. So we've now finished the effect of Stuart, and they are going to be our successor for the next generation until we get our next successor. And since we had a now effect, we don't have anything else that's going to be applied for Stuart. Of course, in the future, we might try to get one of those ongoing effects because they can be quite powerful as well.
Again, if we had chosen Belle, we would have gained one extra fame every time we started a relationship. So I imagine if we did that, then the next generation would be very focused on starting as many relationships as we could to gain those extra fame points. With our successor chosen, we have now finished our first global action of the generation, and we now need to flip that over to show that no one else can perform this action for the rest of the generation. Once again, because we have a successor, in the future when we perform any of these other global actions, we will ignore the successor actions that are printed at the bottom of that tile. All right, our turn is done, which means the white player can go, and they have played two cards. That means they could perform a global action if they wanted to, but they've actually decided to play another card. This is their last one from their hand, and with it, they are going to perform an investment action towards progress. Specifically, they want to make a major investment towards education. That is right over here, and as you can see, the price for education is 3. So that is 3 times 5, or 15 money that they have to spend right now, and then since they bought with a major investment, that industry token will go up twice. So they can spend 15 of their money, and then they'll place this major investment over here in the education industry area. All right, it's now time for the yellow player to go, and they want to play this card from the market. So they'll put that one from their hand back out, and they are going to start a relationship specifically with the politician. They are amicable with the politician, so that means they don't have to spend the three money, and that's good considering currently they don't have any money. So they can start this relationship by putting the token out, and the politician's relationship track is right over here. As you can see, that will immediately get them three fame. And they were at five, so that brings them up to eight. Yellow is done, which means we get to go again, and let's perform another global action. After considering all of the options, I think we want to contribute to our foundation. Now again, we cannot perform this as the first global action within a generation, but this isn't the first, it's the second, so that means we can do this. Now, if we look at the tile, the global part at the top says we can each contribute to our foundations, and the amount we can contribute depends on the century. In the first century of the game, we can contribute up to 20 of our money, and every money that we contribute will turn one to one into foundation. In the second century, we can contribute up to 50, and in the third century, we can contribute up to 150. Now, for us, our perk is that the bank is actually going to match our contribution in that foundation. Now, if we look over here, we have 46 money currently. So I think let's spend 20 of it, which is the max, and that means we will gain 20 foundation plus another 20 with the bank matching it. So we will gain 40 foundation total. At the moment, we only have five, so that's going to bring us all the way up to 45, and that is a gigantic jump on this foundation track. Remember, being at the lead of the foundation track is going to make us first place in the next round, so that's definitely something to consider. But foundation is also going to get us fame at the end of the game. You may have noticed there are these little fame markers around the outside of the track, and what that says is for every 25 foundation that we have, we will gain one fame once the game is over. So, as you can see, it says one fame at the 25 point, and then two fame at 50. But then when we focus over here, you'll notice the fame actually starts to come quicker. Now, technically, this is still every 25, because the denominations of the track shift from 1s up to 5s. What this means is once you have a foundation of 50, you can only gain foundation in chunks of 5. So that means you can't spend 4 to gain 4 foundation, you need to go up to 5. When we look around the board even more... You'll notice that once you hit 150 foundation, the increments go up in 25s. Remember, every 25 foundation is a fame, which is why each one of these shows a fame next to it. That means once you're at 150 foundation, you can only add new foundation in increments of 25. Finally, looking down at the bottom of the board, you can see that once you go from 875 to 900 foundation, you can actually take an extra one of your tokens and place it right over here to track whether you have 900 plus wherever the track is, or 1800, or even greater numbers as the game goes on. Once you hit this point, you will still use this tracker over here, but you must still do increments of 25. So you could go from 900 all the way up to 925. You would not be able to put your token on any of the other increments that show. So, gaining 40 foundation certainly feels good, but as you can see, as we go on and on through the generations, we actually have the potential of having a foundation well into the thousands. So, we've done our contribution, but of course this has a global effect, which means everyone else in turn order can also contribute. Again, they can contribute up to 20, and over here, the white player currently has 13 money. They could contribute all 13 of that. Their foundation is at 4 right now, so that would bring them up to 17, and I think that is what they are going to do. Lastly, yellow can also contribute, except at the moment they have no money. That means we timed this pretty well because only one of our opponents was able to capitalize on that effect. So yellow will not add anything to their unfortunately small foundation over here, and that has now completed our turn.
With our turn done, it's now time for the white player to go, and they don't have any cards in their hand, so it looks like they'll be performing a global action as well. So they can activate one of these six that have not been flipped over just yet, and white has decided to perform the first mandatory global action, and the one they've decided to go with is this one. When we take a close look at the tile, the top says this lets them advance relationships and collect benefits, and this will happen for every single player. Now what that means is every single relationship token out here on the tracks will shift over once to the right, and then everyone will get the effect that's associated with that spot, but the benefit for the white player for choosing this is they get to produce on the benefit of one of their relationship tokens before they actually move it. So that means one of these tokens will give them a benefit before it moves to the right, where it will once again give them that benefit. Now the benefit at the bottom can only be used for the character relationships. You cannot use that for these special figures. In this case, the white player currently only has one relationship with one of these characters, and that is down here with the corporate mogul. So they can select this for their bonus and immediately have this pay out. That is going to get them 20 money, and then every single one of these relationship tokens is going to slide over once to the right, and then pay out whatever that benefit is to the player who gets it. So in this case, the white player will also get 10 more money, so overall they just got 30. They can place this into their area, and then of course the rest of the relationship tokens will slide over once. Up here, we can see the Underworld boss is now at the spot that will get them 10 money. The first spot gave them fame, and the second spot gives money. We can see the spot after that is once again fame, and then after that, it is once again going to be money. So they can take 10 money from the supply, and as you can see, every time this happens, our relationship tokens go over. So as the game goes on and we progress through these generations, these tokens will eventually fall off to the end, because this must happen in every single one of the six generations in the game. Down here, our token is now at the one resource spot, so we can take one resource of our choice. And I think we will take an iron. Finally, as part of the top benefit, every single one of these special figures will also give their relationship benefit again. That means we are going to get 40 more money, so we've received 80 money so far out of this relationship. And then it looks like the white player can use this again, which will let them activate their character's special action. Once again, this says they can discard one resource to take three from the supply, and then they can acquire an heirloom. In this case, they want two die and a cog. And then after that, they've decided to acquire this level two heirloom from the underworld boss. As you can see, that does need two die and one cog, so they can spend all of this. And then they are actually neutral to the underworld boss because that icon does not show up in either the amicable or the hostile area. Again, if they were hostile with the underworld boss, they wouldn't have to pay any fame penalty when they took that heirloom. But that's not the case, so they are going to have to pay the Underworld boss to fame to take this heirloom. White was at 3, so they go down to 1, and the Underworld boss will go up to 10. After that, the Inventor will place this right over here on the orange side, which does show that star, and that's finished their special action. After that, it's then time for the white player to decide on their successor for the next generation. Again, this happens the first time a player does any of the global actions within any given generation, and since they chose one of the red mandatory actions, they can draw one of the face-up successors on the board and then play one of the ones they have in their hand. With that in mind, they're going to focus in on these two and see which one they want to take. Each of them give nothing to the overall foundation, and this historian says that when they are active and that player draws or has dealt any cards, they draw one extra card. The other option is Francis over here, and they say that immediately when this is placed, they can flip over any two non-mandatory global actions, and this could potentially immediately end the generation. Between these two options, it looks like White wants to go with Ethel. And then they have to select a successor. They do have Ethel in their hand, and they also have this successor over here, which is Michael, which they've had in their hand all game. Now, Michael is a prodigy. We can see they also don't add anything to the foundation, and it says when they are in effect, it says you may play a player card at the start of the next generation, just before the first player's turn. Now, the last thing White needs to consider is the impact icon. Ethel has this innovation, and Michael over here has knowledge. And as the inventor, the white player also has that innovation impact icon. With that in mind, white has decided they are going to go with Ethel, so Michael will go away. And then since these icons match, they can unlock either a major investment, a minor investment, or another relationship token, and they've decided to unlock their other major investment token. All right, the inventor's successor is established, and white has now finished their turn. So, this selected tile can be flipped over, and remember, the generation will come to an end once both of the mandatory red global actions have been chosen, and in a three-player game, once up to three of these blue global actions have been selected. That means we are potentially just two turns away from this generation coming to an end.
Well, white is done, which means it's now time for the yellow player to go, and they don't have any cards, which means they will be performing one of these global actions. After considering these five options, yellow has decided to go for the other mandatory action. When we focus in on the tile, this one says they get to resolve the current event. With that in mind, let's focus all the way over here where we have the events. Now at the start of the game, we built an event deck that has two of the third century events randomly placed, then two of the second century, and two of the first. Then we placed one of the first century cards here, and then at the start of the generation, we shift these over. So that means this was the first one, and this one right here is an upcoming event, so this is going to be the one that gets performed in the second generation of the game. Now again, this is a mandatory action, so every generation the event will be performed. So you can certainly look ahead to see what the effects are coming from the next generation. Now for now, this is the current generation, and as you can see, it has text like this, and you can spin it around, and it has text like that. Now the benefit of being the player to choose this is that player gets to decide which of these two halves of the card will be activated. The top right here says that each player can take one gear or one iron from the supply, and the other option says each player must lose one die or one gem or ten of their gold. The yellow player gets to make this decision, and I don't think we're too surprised to see they are going to go with this side, which they think will be more punitive to their opponents. So every player, including the yellow player, must get rid of a die, a gem, or ten gold. And they've decided to get rid of the die. We are also going to get rid of a die. And then up here, the white player does not have a die or a gem to give up, so they must give up 10 gold. After that, we can now take this event and tuck it just like this so that only the part that was activated is visible above the board. Now, once that happens, it's now time to look over here at the details in the bottom right-hand side of this tile. When we focus in, it says in the first, second, third, and fourth generation, the player with the least fame will now choose a matching scoring tile to put into play. Now, by matching scoring tile, that is referring to this impact icon that shows up over here on the event. As you can see, this side shows the commerce, and the other side showed innovation. So by selecting one side of the event, you are also going to influence which of the scoring tiles are going to be chosen. This is the first generation, so the player with the least amount of fame is going to choose a scoring tile. Now, there are two different types of scoring tiles in the game. One is Century, and the other one is Endgame. And right over here, we can see this Hourglass is for Century, and the RIP is for Endgame. That means in the first generation, when this is activated, the player with the least fame is going to select a Century scoring tile. And in the second generation, they will select an Endgame tile. The third generation will be once again Century, and the fourth generation will be Endgame. In the last two generations of the game, this will not be performed. Currently, the white player has the least amount of fame, so they are going to make this selection. And what that means is they must look through this deck of different scoring tiles and select one of them that shows the commerce impact on it. So that means that this one is a possibility, this one is not, this one isn't, that one is, and that one is. So the white player can choose one of these, and then that will be placed right over here. Now there's already one of the century scoring tiles here and one of the endgame scoring tiles, and the difference between these is when they are actually scored. At the end of the first century, the top century tile is going to be scored, and then this will be flipped over. And then at the end of the second century, the tile right over here will be scored. So what that means is the white player right now is selecting the scoring tile that will be activated at the end of the second century, which is of course almost three full generations away. So we will have lots of time to build towards it. Out of all of these options, they've decided to go with Committed Bonus. That says that at the end of the second century, players are going to earn fame based on the value of their major investments. So they can place this right over here, and that's of course flipped face up. And we also have to keep in mind that this right here says at the end of the first century, it is going to be scored, and it says that each player will earn six fame for each relationship that they have with legendary figures. So we are certainly incentivized to start those relationships with the legendary figures in the first century of the game, and in the second century of the game, we are now quite incentivized to make major investments and not sell them. We won't know what the third century scoring tile is going to be until the third generation's event is resolved. Now I did mention in the first and third generation we get these new scoring tiles, and in the second and fourth generations when the event happens, we put out these end game scoring tiles. That means there will be three of these out here once the game is over, and all of them are going to be scored. We know this one right here, it says at the end of the game each player is going to earn six fame for each unique impact icon in their hall of successors. At the moment, we've all been uh, playing our successors to try and match our impact icons, but if we go for diversity with impact icons, we could actually get quite a few fame once the game is over. Now, once again, once we do the event in the second generation, one of these will be picked based off of the impact icon that shows up on the event that is taken, and this will be yet another condition to give us fame once the game is over.
Since this one will happen at the end of the second generation, there will be four generations to work towards that, and the last one will come out at the end of the fourth generation, so still two full generations to work towards that last scoring tile. Well, white has made their selection, so we can place this back here. And then, since this was yellow's first global action of the generation, and it is mandatory, they can take the face-up successor in the market, and then choose one of the successors in their hand to be their successor for the next generation. So, they're going to take Francis right here, and Francis has a power impact icon, and the underworld boss also has that icon. But it looks like they've decided they don't want to go with Francis, instead they're going to go with the successor they drew at the start of the game, and that is Cedric. When we focus in, we can see that Cedric does not have a matching impact icon, so that means they're not going to unlock any of these tokens, but they're feeling pretty fine about that. The reason they picked Cedric is because they really like this ability. That says for as long as Cedric is in play, when an opponent's foundation is increased by any amount, theirs increases by 25. So far, the yellow player's foundation is the smallest, and they're hoping that Cedric will get them a bunch of foundation for free, or they figure in a worst case scenario, this will stop the rest of us from gaining foundation so that they can catch back up again. Alright, yellow is done with their turn, and both of the mandatory actions have happened. Remember, each of these must happen during every generation of the game, but then three or more of these non-mandatory ones will happen. And with yellow done, it's now our turn, and we have to select one of these, and that is going to be the third. This means after our turn, the generation will come to an end, so let's go ahead and choose one of these four options. Realistically, I'm making my decision between these three right over here. I don't think we want to host a trade conference, and I'll explain how that works later on in the video. Now, this one right over here is pretty simple. It says collect dividends, and every player will collect dividends for their investments. When we focus out here, you can see next to the stock market track, there are these dividend areas. This is for a large investment, and that is for a small. So when we collect dividends, every single one of these investments will pay out one of these numbers, depending on the position of that specific industry and the size of that investment. So if we collect dividends right now, the white player has a major investment in education, so that would get them five money. We have a minor investment over here in the military, so that would get us two, and the yellow player would also get two. However, the benefit for being the player to choose dividends is they get to double their overall dividend payout. So that means instead of getting two, we would get four. Now that's not a massive impact, so I don't think we're going to collect dividends. Obviously, this can be very impactful later on in the game when we've invested a lot more in different industries. The next option I'm thinking about is generate heirloom income. Now what this says is every single one of our personal heirlooms, so the ones on the left-hand side of our board, is going to pay out money depending on the specific influence industries that are listed on it. For example, we have this newspaper, which shows our two influenced industries. That is manufacturing and tourism. And when we look out to the board, we can see tourism is at the four money spot and manufacturing is also at that spot. So that means this heirloom would pay out four plus four or eight money towards us. Now, the benefit of being the person who triggers this is they pay it out as if they had plus one of these heirlooms. So it would be like we had two of these heirlooms. So we would get eight plus eight or 16 money. Now, of course, all of our opponents would also have theirs pay out. For example, over here, the white player has two of their own heirlooms and those pay out for the science and education and science is at four and education is at five. So that means each of these will give them nine money. So if we triggered this, we would get 16 money from that extra bonus and they would get 18 money without even gaining the bonus for being the person who selected that action. So that means with both of these options, the white player will technically be making more money than us. And the other option is this one. And realistically, I don't think this is something we want to do, but let's go ahead and talk about it because it works really similarly to this one that we've already seen. Now, this one says you can generate heirloom fame, and specifically, if we look right here, this means you are going to gain fame based off of the heirlooms that you have from your opponents. There is a slash right there instead of the plus that you can see for gaining income, because for every one of those heirlooms of an opponent that you have, you will choose one of the two influenced industries based off of that position out here on the board. So let's say we had chosen this, and we also had taken this heirloom from the underworld boss. In that case, we could then activate one of the two influenced industries, which in this case is law and military. We would choose one of those two and gain the associated fame. Law would be at one fame, and military would be at two, so obviously we would pick the military. Now the benefit for being the player to choose this is you can actually select one of these heirlooms that you have and gain fame benefits from both of the influenced industries. So if we were the one to select this, and if we happen to have this, we could actually gain two plus one or three fame for it. Now again, this doesn't make sense because up to this point, we haven't taken anyone else's heirlooms. 
In fact, the white player is the only one to have done that. So if we chose this, we would get nothing and the white player would get fame. So what that means is for all three of these options that I'm considering, the white player does better, but I think the best one for us is going to be generating heirloom income. So that's going to be the one that we select. And now every player will get paid out for their personal heirlooms, which again are the heirlooms associated with our character. We currently just have this newspaper clipping, but since we selected this, we act as if we had two of these heirlooms. And again, as I said, this is going to pay out for the manufacturing and the tourism, which are both at the four level. So that is going to be four plus four plus eight for this, plus another eight for the bonus heirloom that we can score even though we don't have. So we are going to gain 16 money. And then the yellow player is going to get paid out for this heirloom. That one is for law as well as military. So that is going to be six plus three or nine money that they get for that. After getting paid, finally the white player is going to gain their money. And as I explained before, each of these is worth nine because they have the five and the four. And that is going to be nine plus nine or 18 money that they get when we activated this action. After they've taken that money, this action is done. So we can flip it over. And now at the end of our turn, we can see that the generation is coming to a close. The reason for that, again, is because both of the mandatory actions have been selected, and at least three of these non-mandatory ones have been selected. If this was a five or six player game, then four of these would have to be selected before the generation came to an end. Now we are actually the first player on the turn order track, which means technically we've taken one more turn than the rest of our opponents. That being said, the generation still comes to an end at the end of our turn. Now what we do is we look up here and every player on this track who did not take a turn in this specific round are going to gain one of these listed benefits. As you can see, the amount that gets paid out for these options depends on the century, and right now, white can either gain 20 money, 10 foundation, or 1 resource. Now, they'd really like to gain the 10 foundation, but they are not going to, specifically because the yellow player has Cedric as their successor. If the white player gains this 10 foundation, then that means that the yellow player would gain 25 foundation as an extra benefit, so instead of doing that, white is considering taking 20 more money. Now that being said, white does have a lot of money at the moment and no resources. Their specific character action requires them to have a resource to discard if they want to activate it. So they've actually decided they're not going to go with the money. Instead, they're going to take one resource and it's going to be a cog. After that, we can continue down the line with every player who has not taken an action in this overall round gaining one of these benefits. This means yellow can now gain 20 money, 10 foundation, or one resource. And they've decided to go with 10 foundation. They were at 2, so that's going to bring them up to 12. After that, there are no other players to gain benefits from this track. Remember, you only gain these benefits if you are after the turn order of the player who initiated the end of the generation. Now, at this point, if any of the players had not established a successor, they must do so by playing one from their hand. If they somehow don't have one in their hand, they would draw the top one from the deck and immediately put that successor into play. Now, this would only happen if you took none of the global actions throughout the course of this generation, and obviously all of the players did that in this first generation of the game. The next thing that we do is refresh all of the global actions. And then we discard all of the player cards out here on the table, as well as any player cards that might be in players' hands. And if anyone had successors in their hands, those would also be discarded. Now, if at this point we were coming to the end of the second or fourth generation, we would then proceed to do some change of century things to the board, but that's not the case. So now we just move this down, and that means we can now start the second generation of the game. The first thing we do is slide the upcoming event over so it is now current, and then we can flip the next event over so that is upcoming. Now this event right over here says for one option, says you can increase the education and museum industry values by one space, and the other option says that you can weaken all relationships with the transportation baron and the underworld boss by one space. After that, the upcoming event, which will happen in the third generation, has the options of increasing science and manufacturing industry values by two spaces, or you can weaken all of the relationships between the general and the master thief by one space. So we should definitely keep this one in mind because it will happen at some point in this generation, and that one in mind because it will happen at some point during the third generation of the game. The next thing we do is modify turn order. The player with the most foundation will go first, and that is still us. Second most foundation is the white player, so it looks like they will continue to be the second player. And third most foundation is the yellow player. So the turn order is not going to change, but it certainly could have if these foundation values had been different. The next thing we have to do at the start of a generation is deal three cards out to each player from the current century. We are still in the first century, so we will each get three. And then three cards from this deck will be placed face up over here for a public market. After that, each player is going to get a random successor from the top of the deck. 
and the one that we get is Lyman. We can see they give uh, 20 foundation when we play them in the first century, and as an effect, it says when forming a relationship, the base cost is 50% more. So that means this successor makes it more expensive to perform relationships. That might not seem good, but gaining a bunch of free foundation is certainly a good thing, so that might counterbalance this negative effect over here. After that, we need to deal two more face-up successors onto the table. And the first one is Sly. They are a fast talker, and it says whenever you discard a card for resources, you may treat each resource on the player card as a wild resource. And then over here, Jintro, the liquidator, says you may sell an investment in any industry when playing an investment action. That means you don't necessarily have to match the icon on the card that you played. All right, we are just about ready to take turns in the second generation. But before we get to that, I did realize that I made a slight mistake in the first generation. When we bought a minor investment in military, this should have gone up once. That does mean that when we paid out the money for our owned heirlooms, the underworld boss should have gained one more. So let's add this right over here. And now I think we're correct. All right, let's now take our turn. Let's now take a look at some of the options that we have in our hand. This one right here says we could play it to transfer up to 20 of our gold from our foundation back into our own supply or vice versa. So we could use this to increase our foundation even more or pull money out of our foundation if we really need it in that moment. This one right here says we could just gain 10 gold and there's no cost for that. And this one lets us start a relationship with ourselves because we are the transport baron or we could start a relationship with a legendary figure. Remember, when you start a relationship with yourself, you pay this and then you can either form a relationship with any of the other characters or you can activate your special ability. Now, of course, we could swap one of these cards with one of these on the table and then perform that. This one right here says you could just gain three fame by playing it. And then when we look up here, two of them let you form a relationship with a politician. Two of them let you form a relationship with the socialite. And these two let you form a relationship with a legendary figure. Out of all of these options, I think I would like to form a relationship with a legendary figure. And let's use this card and put... I think this one down instead of it. So we can swap that out and then we can start that relationship and that is going to cost us one resource of our choice. That's fine though, we do have three resources and I think we will get rid of this iron. Next up, we can form the relationship with a legendary figure. And part of the reason we are doing this is because at the end of this century, we are going to get six points for every relationship we have with a legendary figure. Now that's only going to score at the end of the century, which is going to happen at the end of this generation. And it's possible we might get bumped out, but I figure starting a relationship now is still a good idea. So let's focus down here, and it is worth noting that no player can ever have relationships with more than two of the legendary figures at any one point. Now we could go over here and explore once, but I think instead I want to bump yellow off of this oracle. This ability to perform our special action seems pretty great, although when we bump yellow off they will get a benefit. They can either draw a random successor from the deck, or they can draw a random card from the current century, so either way that's going to increase the chances that they draw into something good for them. They'll put this right here, and they've decided to draw a card from the top of the current century deck, but they actually get to draw two. If you remember the effect of their successor, Ethel, it says they are a historian, and whenever they draw or are dealt cards, they take one extra card. That means technically, at the start of this generation, they should have gained one extra anyway, getting four instead of three, and they also should have gained an extra successor, so they have two instead of one. Now, as I said, the benefit for getting kicked off of a legendary figure is you can draw a new successor or a card from the current deck, and they're going to go for the current deck and draw two cards because of Ethel the Historian. That means that this successor has allowed them to see a bunch more cards. They now have six of these cards in their hand, so that means they have the ability to perform lots of these card actions before they even need to do any global actions. After kicking white out, we can now perform our special action. That says we can acquire an heirloom at a two-resource discount or without paying the acquisition fee. With that in mind, I think I'd like to acquire one of the Underworld boss's heirlooms. As you can see over here, we are hostile to them, which means if we form a relationship with them on the board, we will have to lose two fame. But this also means that if we ever take their heirlooms, we don't pay them that acquisition fee of fame. So let's do this at a two resource discount, because of course we weren't going to pay the acquisition fee anyway. And I think we should take their level one heirloom. We don't have a one just yet, and this is going to be fully paid for because it only costs two. And if we weren't hostile with them, we would have to pay them a fame, but that is not the case because we are hostile. Now, this is going to go to the right side of our board. And what this means is in the future, if any player performs this effect, then we will get fame for the law or the military's current fame level. And of course, if we trigger this, then the benefit says for one of these heirlooms, we could get both of those fame amounts. Currently, the military is up to three fame, and that's one reason why we decided to grab this. 
Another reason is because we are essentially putting the squeeze on the underworld boss as far as getting heirlooms for income. Their one and two are both gone, so if they want one of their own heirlooms to create income for themselves in the form of gold, they will need to take their level three at the lowest, and that costs four resources. So that means they are much more likely, I guess, to take someone else's heirloom, but of course, heirlooms from opponents make fame, whereas heirlooms for yourself make you gold, and gold is a pretty important thing to have around. Well, at this point we are done with our turn, so the white player can go, and they have a whopping six cards in their hand to choose from. After considering all of these options, they would like to perform another investment. Specifically, they are going to be investing in science, and they've decided this should be a major investment. That means they are going to have to pay four times five or 20 gold to do this, which they do currently have. Now this is a major investment in science, so it's going to go up twice on this track. And then they can place this over here in the science industry area. All right, white is done, so that means yellow can go. And they've decided not to play a card from the open market. Instead, they're going to play this card from their hand. With this, it looks like they are also going to be investing. And just like the white player, they are now going to go for a major investment. With this major investment, yellow wants to go into law. Law currently is over here. It's pretty cheap. That is going to be 3 times 5 or 15 money that they have to spend. And then the Law Industry token will go up twice. Yellow is done, which means we can take our turn again. And perhaps we should also get into investing. Now, our two influenced industries are tourism, which is red, and the manufacturing, which is orange. And I think we are going to go for red. Now, let's take this one and play it and put this card out. And part of the reason I'm doing that is because I want to deny the possibility of other people using this to form a relationship with legendary figures. They might have cards in their hand that could do that, but I figure there's no reason to try and deny those options from this public market. Now, we are not going for the relationship right now, though. Instead, we are going to invest. And considering the gold payout of all of our own heirlooms are affected by our influenced industries and tourism is influenced, I think let's do a major investment in tourism. Now that is going to cost us 4 times 5 or 20 money, and we are pretty rich at this point, so I think we are just fine making that investment. This means tourism is going to go up twice, and then we can put this major investment token right over there. Alright, we are done, which means the white player can go. And it looks like they want to play this card from their hand, and they are going to form a relationship with us. That shows the Harbor Master icon, and it does say they're going to have to spend six of their gold to do it. Actually, hold on a second. It looks like they are amicable with us. That means they don't have to pay that, so they can take this money back and then start that relationship. They can put the relationship token to the far left spot, and that means they will first get the bonus that's over here, because of course we are a character that's being controlled. So that'll get them one resource, and then their relationship will get them two more. We can see that once this moves over, that will get them ten gold, then six gold, and then finally two more resources once it hits that last spot. Now at this point, you may have noticed this cutout here in the deluxe version of the board because it is two layers, and that does show that these are only the benefits for the first century. Once we go into the second century, we'll put this down, because as you can see it matches, and now it looks like the amount of resources you get is the same, but the amount of gold that you get is more. And then in the third century, the amount of resources for starting a relationship goes up one, and the gold payout gets even better. So for every one of these characters, these are going to be updated when we change centuries, and I'll go into more details about that later on in the video. So, white can now take three resources, and they've decided to take a cog, an iron, as well as one die. Alright, white is done, which means yellow can go. And they've decided to play a card from their hand, and with it, they are going to spend one of their fame to perform their character's special action. So, they'll go from ten fame down to nine. And then their underhanded special action is called Extortion. It says they are going to collect half of the gold from up to three of their opponents, up to a maximum of 5, 50, or 150, depending on the century. And then they will gain 1, 2, or 3 fame, again, depending on the century. It's the first century, so that means they will get 1 fame and half of each of our gold, up to a max of 15. So they'll go right back to 10 fame. And then they'll take half of the white player's gold. It looks like they have 14, so they will take 7. And then over here, we have 61 money. So they can't take half of it, which is 31, because that's over the max, but they will take the max of 15. So that 25 is gone, and we can take 10 back, and they will take this 15 and put it into their area. Well, yellow is done, which means we can go, and we have played two cards already, so if we wanted to, we could perform a global action, and I think let's do it. The only one we can't perform right now is this one because it can't be the first one of the global actions. And I think let's actually do this one, which is the only one we haven't talked about so far. This is called hosting a trade conference. 
And the first thing that we have to do is set up the trade conference by focusing here in the middle of the board. Now there are two different pieces that we're going to place out here, a bottom as well as a top, and the bottom is going to be associated with the current century. This shows a first century, that is for the third, and the flip side of this one is for the second century. We are currently in the first century, so we can place this right over here. And now we are going to take a look at these. Now we can see fame, foundation, as well as resources and gold. And what we now get to decide is which of these we can spend in this trade conference. The thing that we choose is going to be what we spend in order to vie for getting other things while trading. And while we do have a bunch of gold, I think let's actually go for foundation. So we place this right up here. And as you can see, the foundation side has this dark blue background to show just how much foundation you can bid in order to try and gain the other various benefits. Of course, if we had flipped this over, then in that case, we would be bidding resources to try and gain these other effects, which could, of course, be foundation. So once again, with every trade conference, the player who selects it gets to decide which one of the things we can bid for, and we are going to bid foundation. Now the next thing that we can do is take our bidding token and place it down somewhere onto this tile. Now it's worth noting in the deluxe version, this is actually a die which can be used to demarcate various things, and in the standard version, it's a cube, and both of these work in the same way. Now, I think we want to spend foundation in order to try and get some more fame. I think we could probably leverage this pretty well. Uh, if we look over here, we can bid 5, 10, 25, 50, 100, or 200 of our foundation. And I think let's just bid 10 of our foundation and put our bidding token right over here. What that means is we are bidding 10 foundation to get two fame. And remember, at the end of the game, the player with the most fame is going to be the winner. Now, at this point, we can move clockwise to the next player and they can make a bid. That is going to be the white player, and they currently have 17 foundation. That means they could not even go up to the 25 spot. So obviously us going on the 10 location is smart, because with white being at 17 and yellow being at 12, neither of them can actually outbid us here. After considering these options, white is just going to bid 5 of their foundation to try and get 25 gold. After that, it's now the yellow player's turn, and they do have 12 foundation. So if they wanted to, they could outbid the white player by placing this like that on the 10 spot so that they would be bidding 10 of their foundation to get that same 25 gold. Now, after the yellow player makes this bid, we get to make one more modification to this as a benefit for being the player to start the trade conference. In this case, we could move this to any other one of the bid spots in the same row or higher, and that certainly leaves us flexible. Now, technically, the yellow player has not chosen this just yet. Currently, they have no resources. So instead of trying to vie for the white player and spend more of their foundation for money, which currently the yellow player has a lot of because they just stole a bunch, they are just going to do a minimum bid of five foundation over here in order to try and acquire two resources. Yellow is going to commit to that. And then, as I said, as a benefit, we now get one more opportunity to change our bid. None of the other players get to do that. Once again, we can move to a different spot in the same row, or we could go higher in any of these different columns. Now, we could, I suppose, be a pain and outbid the white or the yellow player to deny them those specific benefits. And, you know, I think we are going to leverage this effect. We could stay here, of course, and spend 10 foundation to get to fame, but I think let's shift over here and spend 10 of our foundation in order to get two resources. Those resources will be good because we can use them to acquire heirlooms. And, of course, by doing this, we are going to be denying that effect from the yellow player, and they just stole a bunch of our money, so I'm feeling pretty okay about that. Now, after we've locked in our bonus potential move after everyone has bid, we can now take these benefits. The white player is going to spend 5 foundation, and then they'll get 25 gold. So they go down to 12 foundation, and they can take this gold. And then over here, we are going to spend 10 of our foundation to get 2 resources, and the yellow player does not have to spend anything. So they are bummed they didn't get any benefits out of this trade conference, but at least they didn't lose anything in the process. So let's spend 10 foundation, which brings us down to 35. And then we can take two resources. Now, before we actually do that, I want to very briefly draw your attention back to these tokens, because as you can see in future centuries, it's not just going to be the first player in the bidding to get stuff. In the second century, the second place player will also get a lower amount. And in the third century, the first, second, and third place player will get those amounts. And you get the second and third place benefit while paying the bid that you put your token down onto. So let's take our two resources. And I think we should take a die and a gem. 
That way we could potentially create this level two heirloom. We can't actually create our level one heirloom because we already have a level one over here and that is the underworld boss's heirloom. So that means this is not viable for us for the rest of the game, but of course somebody might take that away from us. And this one right here is going to cost an iron, die, and a gem, and we don't have the die or the gem. So we've now fixed that by spending foundation to acquire these in that trade conference, and now it's time for us to choose a successor. If you remember from before, this always happens at the end of your first global action selection within each given generation. Now, we picked one of the non-mandatory tiles, so that means we will get a random successor from the top of the deck, and then we will choose one of the successors that we have. If we had gone with one of the mandatory ones, we could have chosen a successor from the table, and maybe we should have done that considering I'm not in love with Lyman over here, but hopefully we'll get a bit lucky and find a better option for the next generation's successor. So let's draw one from the top of the deck. And now we have to choose between these two successors. The first thing to note is both of them have the manipulation impact icon, which does not match our character's one. So no matter what, it's going to be one of those. It's also worth noting that uh, this new one right here does give some foundation. In the first century, that is 10. And of course, in the first century for Lyman, we would get 20. That is twice as much foundation. But remember, the effect over here of the imposter is negative for us. It says when forming a relationship, the base cost is 50% more. Now, technically, we could go for Lyman and then just avoid forming new relationships for the entire next generation. That way we don't suffer this penalty and we also gain that extra foundation, which is good. The other option for us is this negotiator named Eric. It says when an opponent makes a relationship that generates a bonus, you also earn that bonus. So this is actually beneficial, although it is somewhat situational. If you remember, the bonuses are these tokens right out here. So that means while we have Eric as a successor, every time one of these are activated, we would also get that benefit even if an opponent activates it. But it seems likely our opponents would just avoid activating these bonuses while we have that effect. Obviously, Eric the Negotiator will be more powerful when you play with more players because this game can go up to six, which means more than half of these characters would have these bonus tokens around. So this is situational, but it's also not bad, and I think we are going to go with Eric and not with Lyman. This means we will immediately gain 10 foundation, and now Stuart the Penny Pincher is retired. We can just slide this right over here because it is important to know what the impact icons were of our previous successors. And now Eric is in charge of everything. So let's take that 10 foundation and remember this effect that might happen to us at some point later on in the game. 10 foundation will bring us from 35 up to 45, and then before anything else happens, the yellow player reminds us that Cedric is currently in control of their legacy. Remember, this effect says that whenever one of the yellow player's opponent's foundation increases, the yellow player also increases their foundation by 25. So that means yellow is going to go from 12 all the way up to 37, and yellow is very happy about that happening. Of course, we didn't really have a choice. Both of the successors that we had had foundation, and this is part of the reason to potentially take one of the successors that are face up on the table, and it's also a reason to potentially do actions like exploring over here to draw extra successors so you have more options to choose from. Obviously, we just had two, but if we had explored even once in the first generation, that would have drawn two more successors, giving us four successor options to choose from. We obviously didn't do that, and the yellow player is certainly happy with how this situation worked out. Well, our turn is done, so now the white player can go. They could do a global action, but they've decided to hold off for the moment. And instead, they're going to play this card from their hand, and specifically the top option says they can spend six of their gold in order to acquire an heirloom for one fewer resource. Now, they can acquire any heirloom with this, and they do have to spend the six gold and they've decided to acquire one of our heirlooms. Now, they have started a relationship with us because they have one of their tokens out on our relationship track on the board, and if you remember, if you have a relationship with somebody with whom you are acquiring an heirloom, you take it for a discount of one. The card they played gives them a discount of one, and this gives them a discount of one specifically when acquiring from us. And with that in mind, they are going to acquire our level 3 heirloom. They wanted to take this level 2 because they love to deny us the ability to buy it. They can see that we are working towards that, but the white player already has a level 0, 1, and 2. And remember, you cannot have two of the same level. So 3 is the next one that they can effectively take, and this normally would cost 3 gears and 1 iron, but they have a discount of 2, 1 from the card, and 1 because they have a relationship with us, so they can buy this by spending an iron and 1 gear. So they can place this right over here, and if this action to generate heirloom fame happens, that heirloom will get them fame based off of manufacturing or tourism. Well, white is done with their turn, so now yellow can go. 
and they've decided to perform a global action because they have played at least two cards. The one they're going to go for is contribute to your foundation. It's still the first century, so they can contribute up to 20 of their gold, and then that will turn into 20 foundation. And of course, since they are choosing this, the benefit says the bank will match that, effectively doubling this contribution. Now, they've decided they are going to go for the maximum of 20, so they can spend that. And then the bank is going to double that 20, which means they will gain 40 foundation total. This means they will go from 37 up to 77, but once you get up into these areas, the increments are in fives, so that means they will go up to 75 instead of 77. I suppose technically that means they probably should have spent 19 gold instead of 20, because 19 when matched gets them 48, which is exactly what they needed to get to 75. And with that in mind, they are going to change that, so they just spent 19 of their gold instead of 20. After that, we could contribute up to 20 of our money to our foundation, and we do have money to spend, but the yellow player still has Cedric the Barnacle over here, which would give them 25 foundation when we gain 20. I don't think we want to give even more free foundation to the yellow player, so we are going to pass for the moment. And now the yellow player can add, and they've decided they are also going to pass. They feel like giving that much free foundation to the yellow player is not something they want to do, and they'll just try to gather that foundation later on in the game. Now that means we're done with the main action, and Yellow can now establish their new successor. This was a blue action they chose, so they will take a random successor from the top of the deck, and then choose one of these, and I think the rest of us are pretty happy to see Cedric be retired, considering that effect was definitely changing how we were playing the game. After considering these two, they are going to go with Ruby. As you can see, that is going to give them 20 more to their foundation because it's currently the first century. And then they have a negative effect over here. It says ostracized, and it says they may not participate in trade conferences unless they are the ones to host it. So if somebody else holds a trade conference while Ruby is in control of the yellow player's legacy, then yellow just has to pass and not bid on anything. But of course, they could start that trade conference if they want. Overall, yellow's not too worried about that, and they do get 20 more foundation. So they'll go from 75 up to 95. Well, yellow is done, which means we get to take our next turn. And while we could perform a global action, I think let's spend this last card that we have in our hand, and let's do it to simply buy an heirloom. We've set ourselves up to have the resources that we need to buy our expert engineer outfit, which is our level 2. That is going to cost an iron, a die, as well as a gem, and we have all of those. And now we can simply flip this over and put it onto the left side of our area. So that is going to generate us income based off of the manufacturing and tourism levels whenever the generate heirloom income action happens. And obviously we are much more incentivized to make that happen now. Well, that's finished a pretty quick turn for us which means the white player can go, and they've decided not to play a card. Instead, they're going to go for a global action. The one they would like to take is Influence Industries. As a benefit, that says they can move both of their Influence Industries up or down one level, and the rest of us can move one of our Influence Industries up or down once. White's Influence Industries are Education as well as Science, so each of these will go up once on the track. Now, after that, the yellow player gets to decide, and their influenced industries are law as well as military. Currently, they're the only ones invested in law, and we have invested in military, so they figure they don't want to help us out any more than they need to. So they are going to influence law and move that token up once. After that, we can move the manufacturing or tourism token up or down once. And I think we'll bump up manufacturing. We are all done influencing, and this was the first global action taken by the white player, so they can now establish a successor. This was a non-mandatory action, so they are going to take a random one from the top, but of course Ethel the Historian is still here, and it says every time they draw a card, they draw an extra one, so they will draw two, and they already had two successors over here, so they can choose out of these four options for the successor that will lead their legacy through the third generation of the game. After considering all of these options, they have decided that Emmerich's is going to be their successor. As you can see, the impact icon on that new successor matches their own, so that means they can unlock one of these two tokens, and they are going to unlock this relationship token here. Now, after that, we can see that Emmerich's is going to add 10 foundation for them, and then there is this effect called Protector, and it says opponents may not acquire their heirlooms while this successor is in play. So that means all of these heirlooms up here can only be acquired by the inventor, at least until the next successor comes along. So White can now take this 10 foundation, which will bring them from 12 up to 22. Well, white is done with their turn, so that means yellow can go. And they've decided to start a relationship with the Philosopher. Now, that would normally cost 6 gold, but as you can see, they are amicable with the Philosopher, so they don't have to spend this, and they can simply put this token down onto the board. 
That'll go right here, and as you can see, the effect of that gives them 4 fame immediately. So they go from 10 up to 14. Well, yellow is done with their turn, so now we can go. And we currently don't have any cards, so that means we have to do a global action, and I think let's go for Generate Heirloom Fame. Technically, the white player has more of these heirlooms than we do, but that being said, if white took this, then they would gain even more benefit than we would, and I think it's a near certainty that white would take this if we left it available to them on their next turn. So let's choose this, and now we'll score all of our heirlooms that are associated with our opponents or our, our level 6 heirlooms. Now the benefit of being the player to choose this means we can take one of these heirlooms and score fame for both of the influenced industries. Normally you only get fame for one of the two influenced industries. Obviously we only have one of these, so we will select this. That is from the Underworld boss, and they are associated with the law and military industries. Military is currently at 3 fame, and law is at 2, so that means we will get 3 plus 2, or 5 fame. This will bring us from 8 up to 13, and then after that, the white player can score their two heirlooms that are on the fame side. They have one from each of their opponents. This one is from the Underworld boss, which shows law and military, but again, since they did not select this action, they have to choose one or the other. Law is at 2 points, and military is at 3, so obviously they will choose military. That means that this is worth 3 fame to them, and the other one is ours. It's associated with manufacturing and tourism, and both of those are on the 2 fame spot, so either way, that's 2 fame. This means they will get 3 fame plus 2, or 5 fame total, which is the same amount that we got. That's going to bring them from 1 up to 6, but of course, if we had not selected this, then they would have scored both industries on one of these cards and that would have given them two more fame, and of course we would have received two less fame. So overall that was a four fame swing on the white player for us by choosing that action. After that, it's time for the yellow player to score all of their fame heirlooms, but they don't actually have any. So far in the game, they haven't acquired any new heirlooms besides this one that they started the game with, and because of that, they're not getting any benefit from this global action. Well, at this point, our turn is over, and that means the white player can take their turn. After thinking it through, they've decided to go with a mandatory action. They are going to go with advanced relationships and collect benefits, and remember, being the player to select this means for one of their character relationships, they will get the benefit before all of the relationships move down, and then everyone gets the benefit of the new lowered position. For this bonus, White has selected a relationship with us. That means they are going to get two resources immediately, and they've decided on an iron and a cog, and then after that, every single one of these relationship tokens is going to slide once over to the right. Next up, every one of these relationships will pay out their benefit. The white player is going to get 10 gold from their relationship with us. Then they will get 6 gold from their relationship with the corporate mogul. So that is 16 gold total there. And then we will get 6 gold from our relationship with the inventor. Next up, there is the yellow player, and this relationship should have also slid down. We can see this one is at the 3 fame spot, and that one is at the 2 fame spot, so yellow is going to gain 5 fame, which brings them up to 19. Lastly, all of the legendary figures will be activated. We have relationships with both of them. It looks like nobody decided to kick us out, or maybe they weren't able to based off of the card options they had in their hands. Now, we are going to get 40 gold from the rich recluse, and we can once again activate our special action. So we can take the gold, and then unfortunately, I don't think we can actually use this effect. It lets us acquire an heirloom at a two resource discount or without paying the acquisition fee. We currently only have one resource, and we have a level zero, one, and two heirloom. So the cheapest heirloom we could take would be a level three, and technically we could afford to take the level three from the inventor because that takes four resources. We could discount two of these away and then discount another one because we have a relationship with them which gives them the discount. The problem is that they are currently under the stewardship of Emerix, which is the protector which stops any other players from actually buying their heirlooms. So even though we have the resource to actually make this happen, and it would be amazing to take a level 3 heirloom for just one resource, we can't do it because of this successor effect, and unfortunately we are going to forfeit our entire special action. Well, the white player's turn is done, so now the yellow player can go. And they've decided they'd like to end the generation. Remember, that happens once both mandatory actions happen, and at least three of these blue actions have happened in a three- or four-player game, and four of these have happened already. So by activating this other mandatory action, that is going to trigger the end of the generation. Before that happens, we do have to perform this effect, which lets the yellow player resolve the current event. The two options available to them say they can weaken all of the relationships with the Transportation Baron and Underworld Boss by one space, 
or they could increase the education and museum industry values by one. Now, education is currently mostly associated with the inventor, and by doing this, that would actually help the inventor out quite a bit. So the yellow player has decided they're going to go for this side, which means all of the transportation baron and underworld boss relationships will be reduced by one step. So far in the game, nobody has started a relationship with the underworld boss, but the inventor does have a relationship with us over here, so this will slide down one space, and I think the yellow player is wishing that might have happened before this other one was activated, because that means the white player would have gained less, but either way, that still makes it so that this relationship will fall off the end and go away one generation sooner than it would have before. The event has now been performed, and now the player with the least amount of fame, which is going to be the white player, can decide which one of these endgame scoring tiles will be activated and scored once the game is over. Now remember, this is going to be dictated by the impact icon showing on the event that was just performed. And in this case, that is the power icon. So the white player can quickly look through all of these to find all of the options that have that icon, and then choose from them. It looks like in this case, there are just two options to choose from. The one on the left is a nostalgic bonus, and it says at the end of the game, you earn fame equal to three times the level of each heirloom that you have acquired instead of one. I mentioned it before, but once the game is over, every one of your heirlooms is going to be worth fame equal to its level. So that means if this is an effect, then every heirloom is worth three times its level instead of one. This option over here is diverse bonus, and it says that each player will earn three fame for each relationship and investment token that they have on the board once the game is over. So far, the white player has the most heirlooms out of anybody, and because of that, they feel like this is probably a good option because they are currently ahead in getting extra points for it. So they're going to choose the nostalgic bonus, and it will be performed once the game is over. We can place this right over here, and the other one will go right back on top of the deck. Yellow's turn is done, and the generation is over. And it looks like we all took the same number of turns, so no extra benefits will be paid out. At this point, if any player had not established a new successor, they would do so, but it looks like we've all taken care of that. So the next thing we can do is flip all of the global actions face up, and then discard all of the cards played this round, as well as any cards left in players' hands, in addition to the cards out here on the table, and any successors that are on the table. At this point, we now need to check to see if the century is over, and that is indeed the case because we are at the end of the second generation. This means we can remove all of the player cards from the century that's ending, and then every player will potentially score fame based off of the top century scoring tile. If you remember from before, this one is Exotic Bonus, and it will give 6 fame to each player for each relationship they have with a legendary figure. When we look down here, we have two of those relationships and nobody else has any, so that means we are going to get 6 plus 6 or 12 fame. Now that is a pretty huge swing, and it seems very likely that our opponents should have actually played against this and bumped us off of one of these, but in this instance it looks like we are going to benefit from them doing other things with their time. So we'll gain 12 fame from that end of century scoring, which brings us up to 25. After that we can flip that scoring tile over. And now we can reveal a new legendary figure. In this case, it looks like it's a monarch. When you start a relationship with them, you are going to gain 10, 25, or 50 gold, as well as 1, 3, or 5 fame. So it's a gold and fame combo. And of course, we are finishing the first century. So in the second century, that is 25 gold and 3 fame for starting a relationship with the monarch, as well as every time we collect benefits from all of the relationships that we have. Obviously, the last legendary figure will be flipped over at the end of the fourth generation as we are moving into the third century of the game. The next thing we have to do is move all of these relationships into the next century. The ones printed on the board are just for the first century, so we can find this right here for the underworld boss, and put it on the second century side. The back side shows the third century. So this will head right over here, and now instead of paying out 20, 12, 4, and 4 gold, it pays out 40, 25, 10, and 10 gold. Next up there is hours, and the overall number of resources paid out isn't increased, but the amount of gold is. And finally there is the inventor, and it looks like the resources paid out does actually increase, as does the gold, and that also happens when we go into the 3rd century. Next up we can place the new exploration overlay down. This is the one for the 2nd century, and that is the one for the 3rd. So far we haven't actually seen exploration happen. Remember, when you do this, you get these benefits times the number of cards that you've played, and then this just tells you how many successors you draw. So in the 2nd century, you get 10 gold for every card you've played when you explore, and you get to draw one successor from the deck. 
Finally, we have to add overlays for the market. As the game proceeds through centuries, inflation does happen. So we can see that these are for the first century. Then this is the setup for the second century, and these can flip over for the third. So we can place the second century sets right here. And by doing that, you'll notice that the dividend payouts have certainly increased. And in addition to that, the stock prices and fame payouts have also increased. All right, we are now ready for the third generation of the game, as well as the second century, so we can move this forward and now start that third generation of the game. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop playing through the game, but I would like to show you what some of these later century cards look like. As you can see in the investment options in the second century, you have the general icon, which leaves you flexible, but also specific icons. And if you influence that specific icon, then you can actually invest in anything. You'll also notice down at the bottom that when you discard these cards, you are going to gain multiple resources instead of the single resources that happened in the first century of the game. When we look at some of the third century cards, as you can see, they no longer have these general purpose icons. Instead, they are associated with specific industries. And when you discard these cards, Cards, you get three resources, and they're specifically the ones listed down at the bottom. But again, I'd like to point out that the Explore and Heirloom Acquiring Actions is the same no matter what century you are taking cards from. At this point, I'd like to focus back on the Generation Tracker. Now, if we were to keep playing the game, then as part of the current event evaluation in the third generation, a third century scoring tile will be placed. And that third tile would actually be scored at the very end of the game. That's, of course, because at the end of the fourth century, not only is a third end game scoring tile placed, but the next topmost century tile is scored. So once we get to the end of the sixth century, there will be one century scoring tile phase up, and there will be three end game scoring tiles. Once we finish that sixth generation, we will score this last century tile, as well as all three of the chosen end game tiles. After that, players will gain one fame for every 25 foundation they have once the game is over. And then after that, they will gain one fame for every 100 gold they still have in front of them. Next up, every single resource that we have in front of us will be worth one fame. So spending these is a good thing in order to acquire heirlooms that can give us gold as well as fame. But of course, having these at the end of the game is also not bad because again, they are worth one fame each. Finally, every heirloom that we have in front of us will be worth fame equal to its level, unless, of course, that has been modified by these endgame scoring tiles. We already saw one that could modify that, and in fact, within these options, there are specific things that could change some of these other scoring conditions that I have already talked about. Now, once we have scored all of these heirlooms, the player with the most fame will be the winner. Well, at this point, I think I've taught just about all of the rules to the game. We've seen one third of the game because we've gone through two out of the six generations, and we've certainly seen a decent amount of buildup. Obviously, as inflation grows, that's going to affect the stock market, and that will certainly make selling these investments more lucrative because buying them in a previous century and then selling them in the next gets you even more overall benefits. I do want to point out that these events over here do increase in their impact as you get deeper into the centuries. For example, this one right here has World War IV, and it says, you decrease all progress industry values by one space. So that means you just slide all of them from that specific column. And this other option increases all government industry values by one. So one of these events could affect three of those tokens. And this is just one example. Uh, this one right here is the resurgence of socialism. And it says all players lose all of their gold and then take 50 gold back from the supply. And this one says all players must pass their remaining player cards to the player to their left. So as you can see, as you get deeper in the game, the event impacts get greater on the overall options that the players have. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning how to play this game, and I hope I was able to give you a good idea of the overall flow as players go through all of these different generations and legacies, trying to get as much fame as possible. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.